So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Larche, uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. I, I really do feel like I'm, I'm standing on the shoulder of, of giants here. Um, so I'm going to walk around the room a little bit because I don't want to block any particular person from seeing the screen. Um, so I actually just moved to Hamilton um, just under six months ago, and uh, this is where I'm from. So does anyone know where that is? Edmonton. Edmonton. So it's actually very, very... Uh, very nice in summer. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and this is it in winter. So it's not a blank slide. I took this photograph. Um, so, so this is me and, and Susan Dyke uh, when I went on the walk for scleroderma uh, last year in Sylvan Lake, Alberta. And um, it was great meeting a lot of the community there and over the next couple of years. Um, as I'm doing my training here, I look forward to getting to know a lot of you as well. So I'm going to address some of the frequently asked questions, uh, round up with a top five take-home points, and then we'll have time for questions. So here are some of your questions. Um, I'm going to go through all of them, but essentially we'll talk about side effects, so why take medications when there's so many side effects? Um, is this related to my, is this my scleroderma? Um, this, this rash or this joint pain, is that my scleroderma? Uh, how do I cope with things like mental health? And, and uh, what are the natural or alternative treatments that may be less toxic for me uh, as compared to some of these things that, that we prescribe? Uh, what about medical marijuana now that cannabis is, is a legal thing? Uh, and then finally, stem cell transplant, as, as we've already kind of touched on. So we'll start with, is this my scleroderma? Um, so iron deficiency anemia. Um, so anemia is possible from just being uh, chronically inflamed. And so whenever you have a chronic inflammatory disorder, you are prone to anemia. It doesn't mean that you're losing blood, but you're probably just not making enough of it. And a lot of these iron is actually sequestered in a lot of the white blood cells. Um, if you have a condition called GAVE, um, which I think we'll probably touch on in the GI talk maybe, um, then you could be having like very, very small amounts of uh, GI bleeding, which can lead to anemia. Um, I've had questions about um, uh, foot fungus and stuff like that, and the answer is, is probably not related to your scleroderma, but, uh, but certainly if you're seeing uh, digital ulcers or pits, uh, then those things can be related. Um, so what about joint pain? Um, so joint pain is very, very common. And in some cases, it could be related uh, to the scleroderma. So I'm uh, not to go over every single cause of joint pain, but this slide is just to show you that there are many, many types of joint pain. Um, and a common question that we have is, I'm so young. Why am I getting joint pain? Why do I feel like my grandmother who is, you know, 150? So, so my grandmother has joint pain. And she's got joint pain because she's old and she's got wear and tear arthritis. But arthritis can come from many, many different causes. And a lot of the people that we see in the rheumatology clinic, I would say that at least half of them are what we consider young. And many of them are in their 20s. And the reason for that is because many of the causes of arthritis and joint pain, as you see here, can occur at any age. So it can occur from, from the time you're a child uh, to the time your uh, my grandmother's age. So the second question is, why would I take any of these medications? Uh, there's a lot of side effects there. Uh, you know, fatigue, uh, nightmares, it is Halloween, I guess, um, diarrhea, and death. So uh, methotrexate is, is very common. Uh, we use it for inflammatory arthritis. We use it for connective tissue disease, uh, lupus, eye inflammation, vasculitis. Um, and so some of the common side effects are stomach upset. Um, so who's, who's heard of methotrexate or, or know someone who's been on methotrexate? So a lot of people have, in this room have maybe heard of or have been on methotrexate. And, and I would wager that probably many of you have had some degree of stomach upset. Um, but I would say that probably not a whole lot of you have had severe respiratory failure from lung disease. Uh, you know, you probably haven't uh, needed a liver transplant from liver injury. So there's a lot of uncommon things that are quite serious, but the good thing is that they're uncommon. 
And so we do a lot of things to actually take precautions and to avoid these uh, very serious side effects, uh, such as monitoring your liver enzymes and making sure you're not getting pregnant while you're on this medication. Um, and when I say alternatives, uh, what I mean by alternatives is, is, is not an alternative medication, but sometimes, uh, well, I mean in all the time, uh, these medications are prescribed for a reason, and the reason is to suppress the, the disease from further progression. And so the alter if the alternative is further progression, worsening of symptoms, and a further worsening of your quality of life, then, then sometimes that's the unfortunate alternative to not taking the medication. The next drug that I'll talk about is cyclophosphamide. So who's heard of cyclophosphamide? Probably. Well, Dr. Larson, you heard of cyclophosphamide. <laughs> uh, well, um, so I guess that's a good thing. Um, so cyclophosphamide is a carpet bomber. It is the big cannon immunosuppressive medication. It is very, very effective. Um, but one of the downsides of that is that it, it does have some significant side effects. So the common side effects are nausea, infections. So no one ever dies from nausea, but you certainly can, um, can die from things like bladder cancer. And fortunately, those things are very, very uncommon. And again, uh, we have a lot of precautions in place before we start someone on such a medication uh, to prevent these, these things from occurring. So you shouldn't be taking this if you're pregnant. Uh, so my grandmother shouldn't be taking it. Uh, family planning, uh, bladder disease, you should, probably shouldn't be taking this medication. Um, and usually by the time people need cyclophosphamide, they're in the intensive care unit and uh, things are really not looking good. And so the alternative to not taking it in those circumstances uh, may be worse than the side effects. So what's the bottom line on side effects? So we always learn this thing called do no harm in medical school. And so I get asked this question all the time. Well, you know, you give the patient a medication and they get terrible diarrhea. Well, you've done harm, right? And I guess technically you have, but, but what that means in this context is doing no harm in terms of you've made an adequate risk benefit assessment and that, and that if you were not to prescribe the medication, the predictable course of the disease would lead to much, much more harm. And so that's why we prescribe the medication only when the estimated risks um, are worse than the benefits of the medication. So again, the decision to treat is always an informed one. It, it involves you, your family members, uh, your physicians, and anyone else that is important to you. Uh, so on to the third question. So what about things like mental health? Um, you know, what about depression, anxiety? Um, so there's a lot of resources in the community and probably the best person to hook you up with those resources are your family physicians. Uh, they do get sort of specified, dedicated training in those types of resources for mental health and that would probably be your best uh, person to go to. Um, of course, you know, the common sense stuff, regular diet, good exercise, and, and optimizing your sleep, uh, social supports, and uh, talking to your, your family doctor, keeping them in the loop. So what about natural treatments? So who here has, has been on or tried a natural treatment or is interested in, in trying a natural treatment? There are probably uh, a lot more of you uh, than <laughs> would raise your hands, and that's totally fine because at least in the States, there's $3 billion uh, spent on natural treatments every year. And there's over 500 uh, remedies um, that are marketed to the public um, for treatments of arthritis and scleroderma. So there's lots of stuff out there. Um, so I am not a naturopath, and I don't speak on behalf of naturopaths, but a lot of them, what they will do in terms of these inflammatory disorders, will prescribe uh, high-dose NSAIDs. So those are things like Advil, Aleve, Ibuprofen. Uh, they will prescribe high-dose probiotics because they believe that the disease is very much linked to the gut bacteria, which we do have some evidence for, and restricted diet. So it's kind of like similar to a paleo diet. I won't go too much into that. Um, but what is... So I don't know if you guys can all see, but if you look at this picture, what do you guys think this is? 
that's the that's the kidney. So uh, who here has heard of scleroderma renal crisis? <laughs> okay, we, we did not actually plan this together. Uh, but what is, so the point of these these pictures there um, is that on on top you you have a snake, and that is the the Brazilian viper. And so what it does is uh, when it when it snatches a mouse, it injects a bunch of venom, and the venom actually inhibits the, they, they found this to be the, the case where it inhibits the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. It drops the blood pressure and basically the animal has a stroke and then it's just killed by the viper. And the reason why I bring that up is because they've actually taken this venom and they've made it into a medication. And it's called Captopril. It's an ACE inhibitor. Many of you may have heard of things like enalapril, lisinopril, peridopril, captopril, and this thing saves lives. And so the point here is that a lot of the medications we use are actually natural. So L-tryptophan is an essential amino acid, which means that we don't make it, but we need it. Where do we get it? From our diet, so plants and animals. It's converted in our body to serotonin and various vitamins. And it's, it seems to be useful in a lot of stuff, like smoking cessation, uh, emotional and mental health conditions, uh, better athletic performance, weight loss, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. And this is something you can just pick up off, off the shelves, right? It's a, it's a natural product, it's, it's essentially a vitamin. Um, but what I'm gonna show you in the next slide is kind of interesting because this came out in the 1980s um, where they found this new disease called eosinophilic um, myalgia syndrome, where these people have a lot of eosinophils, they have a lot of myalgia, like their muscles really hurt, they get a lot of organ involvement, and guess what? In the fourth line here, so uh, let's see, five patients, the biopsy findings were characteristic of scleroderma. So they actually found that this thing that you could get off the shelves caused something that looked like scleroderma. It didn't cause scleroderma, but it caused something that looked like scleroderma. And the bottom line here is that something that's natural can actually be toxic. And so this was eventually traced back to a factory in, in Japan that had some uh, contamination in, in the machines. And so they, they took it off, so it was banned from the US, but now that they found the factory, the factory shut down and now it's back on the shelves again. So the bottom line is some of our drugs are from natural sources, and a naturally sourced compound doesn't guarantee safety. A lot of alternative therapies haven't been tested, and those that have been tested have not always proven to be effective or safe. Um, but there's lots of things that are effective, like Tai Chi, uh, physiotherapy, obviously. There's a lot of good data for acupuncture, and the billion dollar question these days, what about medical marijuana? So cannabinoids in scleroderma. So there are lots of experiments that have been done um, in mice, and a lot of them show that cannabinoids, which are a part of marijuana, uh, do have an immunosuppressive effect, which I guess is good. Um, in mouse models in scleroderma, because that's the focus of tonight, there is some effect on skin fibrosis, and so um, when you when you um, stimulate the, the second cannabinoid receptor in mice, uh, they actually have less skin fibrosis uh, and better lung scores compared to mice that, that are not stimulated. So there's a lot of clinical trials in rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and fibromyalgia. Um, currently, it's not a part of standard therapy just because there's just not enough evidence to say that it works in humans. There's not enough evidence to, to, to inform us of the risks. And there's also, um, there's also known interactions between the um, medical marijuana and other medications which you may be taking, such as warfarin and, and a number of other mental health uh, drugs as well. So we currently don't recommend this uh, just because we don't know enough about it. So uh, th these are some of the sort of the adverse effects of cannabinoids. Uh, of THC and of marijuana in general. Um, a lot of patients I've met have said that 
you know, uh, CBD oil has been very useful for their pain. Um, and I, I certainly don't disagree with that, and I think that's fantastic that helps for your pain. Um, there are pain clinics that we can refer you to. We don't know which ones prescribe CBD oil and which ones don't. Um, but the best person, the, the best place to go to ask those questions would be the pain clinic. And finally, stem cell transplant, uh, is it for me? So we kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, I won't go through the, the excruciating details of all the medical jargon, um, but I think this is probably um, an important one to talk about, the ASTIS uh, trial that Dr. Khalidi mentioned. And so this, this slide is not to tell you what happened in the trial, but to, but to say how this trial may actually be relevant for you if you're interested in getting a stem cell transplant. So um, who was included? So the people that were included in the trial uh, may be relevant for you if you are someone who's like this person who was included in the trial. So the people that were included were patients that were 18 to 65 years old. They had diffuse systemic sclerosis. Um, they did not have the disease for more than four years. They had moderate to severe skin involvement. Um, there was some internal organ involvement, but it wasn't severe enough that it was completely irreversible and uh, beyond repair. So who was not included? So patients with severe pulmonary arterial hypertension were not included. Um, and, there were, and if they had serious other life-threatening comorbidities, they were not uh, allowed to get a stem cell transplant. So what were the benefits? So uh, they found that with the, the transplants, over a long period of time, uh, patients were actually doing a lot better. So basically their disease went away to the extent that it didn't really affect them anymore. Um, when they looked in the mirror, they, they didn't see it anymore. And they certainly lived. Uh, quality of life, lung function. And it's important to mention that the most dramatic improvements in patients who've had the stem cell transplants uh, were people that did not smoke and, and, and had never smoked. What are the risks? So the, with every therapy, there are risks. Um, and they found that within the first year of getting the transplant, um, there, more, there were more deaths related to the transplant procedure because as some of you will know, um, it involves chemotherapy to wipe out all of the bone marrow, which then puts you at risk for infection. And then they put your own stem cells back to reboot your immune system. And so because that involves a lot of heavy medication, um, that does have uh, mortality associated with. So within the first year, um, there could be significant risks. And again, most of those risks were associated with smoking as well. So stem cell transplant in Canada. Uh, so again, maybe good treatment for some, but not all patients with scleroderma. Uh, currently, it's done in Calgary and Ottawa. Your first point of contact will be asking your rheumatologist, uh, and if deemed appropriate, a uh, referral will be made uh, to the big centers uh, in, in Ottawa. So usually what happens there is uh, you will get on the phone with um, one of the, the physicians in Ottawa who does these transplants. They'll do a consult over the telephone with you, uh, and if not, you can fly over there and, and have the meeting uh, in person. And then if you were uh, approved to, to go through the transplant, uh, then essentially you would fly to Ottawa for uh, about four to six months uh, while you go through the procedure and, and, and recover from it. So uh, I've come to the end. Uh, here are the top five take home messages uh, for, for my part. So all drugs have potential side effects, uh, whether they're chemically synthesized, so you know, like the methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, or they're naturally sourced like the L-tryptophan. A drug is prescribed only when the benefits outweigh the risks of side effects and the disease itself getting worse. We don't know what the role of CBD oil is in scleroderma and arthritis, but you know, certainly there are, there's lots of experiments being done, and in the next 10 years, we're probably going to know a lot more about that. Uh, stem cell transplant could be an option for you if you're otherwise reasonably healthy if you have diffuse uh, systemic sclerosis that is rapidly progressive and you've had it for less than four years, 
Um, and even better yet, if, if you haven't smoked before, then it, it could be a very good option for you. And then the fifth one, so um, who here brings a family member or brings a, a notebook to their doctor's visits? There's lots of family members here, so I guess this is sort of a doctor's visit. But um, So what I've been trying to tell my patients uh, nowadays is, is the importance of, of empowering you as the patient with, um, with knowing about your disease and your health condition. And so what I've been trying to tell patients is that, you know, the doctors tell you so much stuff, and at the end of the day, um, a lot of the time what happens is that they, they go home to their families, um, and then their spouse says, well, you went to see Dr. So-and-so, what did they tell you? And, and you know, say, I'm not really sure, you didn't really tell me much, they still haven't figured out what's going on, and don't really know what to do with me, when, when in fact the reality is that there's so much communicated that it's just so hard to keep track of, right? So I would encourage you to bring a family member or, and have a notebook um, with, to every single doctor's visit so that when you go back to your family doctor, your family doctor says, okay, well, uh, what did the rheumatologist tell you? You can say, okay, well, let me check my notebook. Um, and in that notebook, what you should write is not a whole lot. All you need to write is what your diagnosis was and what the plan was. So number one, you're going to get blood work. Number two, you're going to get an echo. Number three, I'm going to see the other specialist. Um, it's, it's very, very simple. And so this is a way that you can sort of take your, your health into your own hands to, to the next level. Um, because sometimes if, you're, if your rheumatologist leaves or your specialist leaves and your family doctor needs to know what the previous doctors have done and the records aren't available for some reason, you have your record. So, uh, so I really encourage that. Um, so anyways, that's, that's it for me. Thank you very much.